Okay, friends, let's get back in. We're going to start a new topic within the world of tefillah. We're going to start. What? 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 what, what? I'm a cool guy. I'm a cool guy. You know my policy? Think Yiddish, dress British. Okay. What about Farsi? Okay, let's go. We're going to talk about Korbanot. Korbanot. We are on page. Page 20. Ladies, phones away, please. Computers only open to blank pages. You can tag me on Facebook afterwards. I have to do it now. Or Instagram, your age. Korbanot. What does the word Korbanot mean? Sacrifice. Korbanot. We use the word sacrifice. I don't like that word. No. I don't like it. It's not actually what it means. Sacrifice has connotations of Self, but destroying something, appeasing the gods, small g. Yeah, and you can close all this, darling. It doesn't have, we're on page 20. Yeah. Right? I don't really like, although I use the word sacrifice in the book, my translation. Oh, yeah. Well, that's better. No, I'm not better. It doesn't really do it. So let's have a look at the show. Remember, every Hebrew word has a show, a show root. What is the root of the word korban, not korban? Anybody know? Can you find a root in that word? Remember, every root, every yeah. Hebrew word has a show resh. Has a show resh. Yes! Oh, um, karov. Karov, karov. yeah, what does karov mean? Is huh? the name come close? Well, what? Come, come close? close, yeah. Like kirov. Yeah. Karov. I karov, kirov, to bring you close. There's something about the avodah of the Korban, there were many different types of Korbanot, brought at different times, different ways, different people. Ultimately, they all have one thing in common. They brought the bringer closer to Hashem. Brings bringer closer. It brought the bringer closer to Hashem. Korbanot Karov. Now, we're gonna try to understand that, but ultimately, one moment. Oh. Yeah, what is that? What the? It's not a normal water. Step on it. You step on it. Hey, I'm scared of inside. Where is it? I'm not looking. Oh. I didn't see it. Thank you. I'm gonna. Wow, she's looking in here. Got rid of it? She was just chilling. She wasn't even phased. Oh my god. Sorry, that just really. I was actually walking in Manhattan this morning. I saw a cockroach on the street walking next to me. I literally, I think my cockroach is joking as a kid in Israel. I let out a scream like a seven year old girl. <laughs> it was not pleasant. The only thing that scares me is Thank you so much. Wow. I need you in my house. I have three jobs in my house take out the garbage, change light bulbs, kill insects. That's it. And look good. What do you do on Shabbat? Do you kill Bagnus? No, Shabbat? I don't kill Bagnus. It's a sword. Shkita. You're not allowed to kill Bagnus. Unless they're threatening you. Okay, it's also Shabbat, not Nehara. Different class. Different class. Okay, Korbanot. Although actually it's related, because Korbanot were brought on Shabbat. So that's going to be very interesting. Okay, yeah. What's that? You have a question already? From Karov to close. So what does that mean? So that means something about bringing Korbanot brought the person who brought the korban, whether it was an animal or grain or fruit, there were many different forms of korban, not closer to Hashem. So it's not right to call it, because sacrifice has the idea of killing an animal, close the door please, you're killing an animal in order to appease the gods. This is not what korban not were, and not what they will be. Because friends, korban not, they're coming back. Oh yeah. When the third and final Beit Hamikdash is built, Erica. Could Karen also be? No, Karen is a horn, and that's different. This is Karev with a bet. Okay, yeah. The, the shoresh, just I just because I use the word, when I use the Hebrew word. I want to show me the root, the root of the word, the shoresh. Every Hebrew word is a shoresh, a root. Oh. Two of usually three letters is Karov. Oh. That's what I put over there. Yeah, we good so far. Oh, We're on page twenty. Korban, no, that's a vowel, yeah. No, just Korban. No, that's Korban. That's singular, that's the plural. Where were the Korban not brought? Let's talk about that for a minute, because that's going to be very, very important as well. In the, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't, 
Oh, good question. Good question. It's probably a reason to it. I'm not sure the answer to that question. That's a very fair question. I have, I have a theory. <laughs> okay, one second. Let's, 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 I want to just bank that. Let me just go, Erica. I know you read a book once. When you were 12. And Harry Potter. And Harry Potter discusses it in Hogwarts. We're going to come to you, Erica. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's go out. Seven, my, my other class, I mean, who's in my Mashiach class? Oh, you it's mean silent. You know, that, that, nothing at all. Rabbi, it's so much better. Such a nice it's so Rabbi. much better. Rabbi, Rabbi, today, Rabbi, today, Rabbi, today Rabbi, we're talking Rabbi, about reincarnation. Rabbi, then all the started women start talking. Then again, busy, right? Then they wake up. Do a mitzvah, yeah, Shabbat, yeah. Reincarnation. Every Sephardi woman is like, oh, Baruch Hashem, it's the Baruch Shemot. Okay. I can't wait to write it up for the Shiach class. Okay. Korbanah. Now, where were they brought? So where is very important, and by the way, bigger question, this is a class on prayer. Why are we talking about korbanot? This is a class of tefillah. Why korbanot? Because we cannot bring korbanot, and the prophet Hoshea we're going to see is going to teach us that we're going to use our lips as the substitute for korbanot. So before there was, or I should say before there was, in conjunction with prayer, King Korbanot. There's a lot more we're going to connect them to. Firstly, and most importantly, where were they brought? So originally the Korbanot were, well, actually it, it predates, I'm going to say the Mishkan, but we know the Noah brought Korbanot, right? We know Avram brought Korbanot. The Torah itself talks about them bringing Korbanot. Right? The first thing that Noah did, right, was to bring Korbanot from the animal, the kosher animals that were on the Teva, on the Ark, because there were seven by seven, not two by two of kosher animals. So it goes right back. And I'm really sure this idea of being a korban exists, pre-exists Judaism, right? And the giving of the Torah. That's worth mentioning, as does prayer. We already know that, yeah? But for us, the Jewish people, it was brought, well, actually, the korban Pesach was even given, was brought by the Jewish people in Egypt. So before you even became the Jewish people were bringing korban up. There's a lot going on over here, my friends. But officially, it's part of the Jewish service. It was in the Mishkan. Although there was a time people had their own personal bamot, their own personal, and you were allowed up to a certain point in Jewish history to bring your own personal sacrifices in your own backyard. And even the Jewish people entered into Israel there was a period of time they did that. And then the big diminish was created and they were forbidden forever bringing personal korbanot. But there was a time when Jewish people as individuals were. The first place is the Mishkan. They were brought to the Mishkan. And then later on, in the Beit HaMikdash. Yeah? The Beit HaMikdash. We so at first it was the Mishkan and then the Beit HaMikdash. Yeah. But people brought individual korbanot all the time. Pre and post the giving of the Torah. Pre and post the <coughs> destruction of the Mishkan. However, once the Beit HaMikdash was built, even after it was destroyed. Okay, the only place you could bring a korban was a communal in the Beit HaMikdash, first and second Beit HaMikdash, which non-coincidentally was located in Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim. So Yerushalayim is gonna be the center, the epicenter of korbanot, and we're gonna remember, we talk korbanot, we're talking tefillah. The two are synonymous. The two are synonymous. I mean, literally. We, one of the activities was Ketoret, for example. Read the Ketoret. We had the Shachar Korban. We read Shacharit. It literally comes. All of our prayers comes to do one for the other. So if we're going to talk Korbanot, you've got to at this point talk about the Beit HaMikdash, which became the epicenter of all prayer. And even though we do not have a temple today, our tefillat are always going to be focused towards Yerushalayim and the Beit HaMikdash, okay? Let's start with some sources over here on page 20. Let's flesh this out, okay? So let's start by talking about the Beit HaMikdash itself and how this came around and what this has to do with prayer in general and the Korbanot. There is a mitzvah in the Torah to build a holy location called a Mishkan, which eventually became the Beit HaMikdash, the permanent Mishkan. As it says in Shemot, in the book of Exodus 25.8, 
Kaf-Hey, hey, Pasuk Chet. Va'asu li mikdash, built for me a mikdash, v'shochanti betocham. That's what the Torah tells us. Build for me a holy place, and I will dwell betocham. What does that word betocham mean? There's two interpretations the rabbis give us. Betocham. Ba'asuli mikdash, v'shochanti betocham. What does betocham mean? No, 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 that's betachon. That's the chet. This is betocham. Betoch. Inside. Hmm. Interesting. So one interpretation means, betocham means, the literal, when you read it, means among them. I in it. Make me a holy place of Hashem. Make for me a mishkan, and I will dwell in it. I will dwell my presence as Hashem in it, in the Mishkan. So Hashem is like, my presence will be felt more in this. When you build this Mishkan, when you do the 39 Melachot to build this Mishkan, I will dwell within it. I built the world with 39 Melachot for you to live in. You build this miniature world and I'll dwell within it. That's the Mishkan. Okay? Great. That's Betocha. But the word Betocha means also, like you said, inside you. So it's among you, but actually inside you, in you. Both work linguistically. Betocham means among you, but also means betocham inside you. Betocham could actually mean both. Betocham means inside, cham means plural, okay? Worth knowing. So something about this holy temple in existence gave HaKadosh Baruch gave us the ability to allow Hashem to dwell among us, okay, and among us. Now, I'm also talking about the Korban, not in the Beit HaMikdash, because we don't have a Beit HaMikdash today, but we do have a Mikdash Ma'at, a small <coughs> miniature Beit HaMikdash, which we're gonna see when we get there, is very, very reflective of that one. Does anyone know what it is? Sure. Well, there's a couple of, you could give me a couple of answers to this question. <laughs> This, ad, this question could actually have a couple of answers, if, we, if, we, if we're really honest about it. One is the Beit HaKnesset, the synagogue, right? The design of it, everything about it we're gonna see is very reflective. But there's actually another answer you could give me. You never know what? Yeah? That it could be wrong, um, but the Kotel. Well, what? The Kotel. No, the Kotel is just a wall that surrounds the mountain that's close to where the Beit HaMikdash, where the Kodesh Gerashim was. No, I'm talking about today, where the experience <laughs> is actually recreated. You don't realize that. It's great shame, this. Yeah? Your own house. Your own house, specifically? Yeah? How do you say? Sure. Sure, we did already. Mikdash Ma'at is Beit Yeah, we did that already. What is it called? Mikdash Ma'at. A small mikdash is the Bet Knesset. We're going to see that. But actually, to be fair, it's something else which relates to prayer as well. Shabbat, the Shabbat table, the Shabbat experience is also related to it, is it not? I mean, just for fun, let's just go through it and this will hopefully blow your minds. Let's just go through what was inside the Bet Mikdash. Let's go through some of the stuff that was inside. All right, and let's see where we can kind of recreate this. I mean, it's kind of a side point, but actually maybe it's more related than we realize. It is actually more related, but I have to do it. What was inside the Mishkan and the Beit Shabbat Mikdash? Throw some stuff out. The there was an Aaron, right? That was the Ar, which had inside it the Luchot, and the first ever Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. So it was inside, it was on a shelf outside. What else was inside? We have the Menorah. Right, there was korbanot, which is the major aspect of what was happening was korbanot, which is a number of things, forgive us for sins, gratitude, there's a lot going on over there. There was the, the le, very nice, there was the shulchan, there was the table, Ketoret. right? There was the ketoret, yeah, right? The incense that was brought, the 11 spices that were brought daily, 
the there was the incest of the Torah. Oh. There was the meat, the basar that was brought, a lot of meat going on inside there, right? A lot of blood as well. Yeah? On the Shulchan, there was the Lechem, Ha, Ha, Nim, the 12 show breads, face breads, because you saw the side, the face of the breads, they were wrapped up in two racks, six and six. Wine. What did you think? Wine, yeah, yeah, very nice. Wine was always put, except on Sukkot, water was poured out, by wine. And of course, every korban needed to have salt. Mela, right? Oh, mela, yeah, very, very good. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Look familiar? Hello. Salt on the table comes with the korbanot. Yan on the table comes with it as well. Lechem apanim are the breads that are put there. Some people actually have 12 little loaves. Some people say the little breads with a little bulk look around it. Comes with that as well. We learn Torah, the lights. Of Shabbat relates to the menorah as well as well. Come now, we have the Shulchan, our holy Shabbat table. We have the Ketoret, the Druva smells. We have the Basa on the table. Wow. I mean, just for interest, you can't miss that connection how the Shabbat table and experience actually is a reflection of the Mishkan as well. But that's another topic, but it's worth knowing that maybe the Tefillot on Shabbat, right? Maybe they're more powerful. more powerful, yeah. Maybe this I don't know. I'm, I'm just. I'm right just when you like that. light Shabbos candles, like the, the, the gates are open or whatever. Yes, very special time with tefillah. Yeah. Very, on, very, very on much. On Shabbat so. they wouldn't do carbonot. They were not carbonot. They were allowed to. They were allowed to. Because there was specific carbonot that was brought on Shabbat. No, on Shabbat itself. There's a mitzvah in the Torah, and they were allowed to bring carbonot on Shabbat. That's why we bring a musaf. We pray musaf on Shabbat. Because the Musaf Korban was brought so you could on, on Shabbat. No, you cannot check on Shabbat. No, no, You're not. In the Beit they did they to bring Korban on. Yes. Okay. They were given out of them. Okay? This Mishkan is going to become the epicenter of the Beit the epicenter of. That was very cool, that by the way, right? I remember that. Good. Fantastic. It was worth it. I wasn't going to mention it, but it came to my head. Baruch Hashem. Let's have a look at the commentary of the Ibn Ezra on this mitzvah of Asuli Mikdash, which is Hanti the Mets of the Mets of the Mets of the Mets of the Israel, I'm going to reside among the, uh, the Jewish people. Do you know them? The Lord your God, 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 the Lord to help you dwell among it. By the way, this is plan B. One second, this is plan B. Plan A, according to the Ramban and others, is that we didn't need a Mishkan. Only because of the Cheta Egel, because the sin of the golden calf, did they actually need a Mishkan and eventually a Beit HaMikdash as well? Well, what would have happened without it? People would have just brought their own Korbanot and prayed to Hashem by themselves. This is plan B. Somehow this is a fix-up for the Chet Egel. You have to know what the sin of the golden calf, why this ends up fixing it up. It's a communal thing, obviously. We have to be together. We can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. It says the Ibn Ezra, as ye do, they will know that I took him out of Egypt and they're going to make me a Beit HaMikdash. I'm going to be within them. Right? The Chet Eagle pushed Hashem away. Right? And this ends up bringing them close. Yeah? So there's something about the Mishkan and eventually the Beit HaMikdash that allowed, and that's what the Gemara tells us, in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, Yeshua Ben Gamma, the decree, the local school children, should study with teachers in Jerusalem because of the inspirational influence. There's something about the land of Israel that gives an extra influence when it comes to this. Let's look at the Rambam on the other side, and then we're going to figure out three reasons the function of the Korbanot. He says the Ramban, Nachmanides, on page 21 at the top. The Sod Mishkanu, the, well, the Sod is the foundation, but it can also mean the secret. The Ramban was a great Kabbalist, by the way, if you don't realize that, probably one of the last great Kabbalists in Jewish history. That the great honor that resided in Har Sinai, Shochen Allah bin Star, would hide secretly, discreetly upon the nation. So, whatever happened in Har Sinai was very loud. However, remember they ruined that experience with the Cheta Egel. But Hashem said, I'm going to let you have this Har Sinai experience forever. 
And that is because I'm going to allow my Shechina, it's not going to be on Har Sinai. My Har Sinai is not important to us anymore. We don't care where it is. Interesting, right? I don't care where it I is. I don't care. I'm so curious. Sure, I think maybe curious. We don't care. If I found it, okay, very, very good. The take a picture. Time, a take a selfie. This is where going to the, take a selfie. This is where God spoke to the Jewish people. This is what it was given. And I'm off. And yet, and yet, the Beit HaMikdash, that mountain, is the epicenter of Jewish life. Why is that? There's a reason why. Who brought the holiness to Arsinai? Hashem did. Who brought the holiness to Beit HaMikdash? We did, because we built it over there. It shows that when we build something, it has a higher Kedusha than Garish Bach. We just came and left. Why? Interesting to know that. But it's not God's hand. Because we put an effort into it, so we brought the Kedusha to that place. The Kedusha remains. Hashem Shechina never left the Makom HaMikdash. Well, let me just finish off the Ramban. Let's not interrupt the Ramban. He's talking to us. So the Har Sinai experience continues somehow in the Mishkan. Okay? Vayab Mishkan, Tamid. Right? What was always there. Am Yisrael HaKavot, Lahem. So the glory that was built in the Har Sinai is constantly among the Jewish people in the Mishkan. And... When Moshe Rabbeinu <coughs> came and brought Nevoah, where did Moshe Rabbeinu receive his Nevoah? Isn't it like where was close he? to Har Sinai, but not there? No, no, that's at Har Sinai. Oh, but oh. In the Mishkan, in the Kodesh Kedashim, what we refer to as the Ohel Moed. In the Ohel right, Moed, which literally means we call it the tent of meeting. The word moed means a meeting place, right? That's why the Jewish holidays are called the moedim, because there are times of the year we meet Hashem. So there are times when we meet Hashem, but there's also a place where you meet Hashem. And that's the tent of meeting, and that's a reference to the Kodesh Kedashim. You follow me, sisters? Yes, yeah, a lot going on over there. Write it down, right? In the... Mishkan. So that's where Moshe Rabbeinu received actually from the Ark, the angels. There was a gap in between. Hashem spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu from above the Ark of the Aaron Kodesh. But it happened in the Mishkan from that place. as the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. Okay? So he says, we're now talking about something. This is the epicenter where Akarosh Baruch reveals, revealed himself to Moshe Rabbeinu in the Kodesh Kodesh. This is a big thing, right? Because the Kosh Baruch right? The conversation of Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest prophet, continued throughout our time in the Midbar, in the desert. Okay? So that's where the Mishkan is now going to be the epicenter of Jewish life and communication. Communication with Asana Hashem. Okay? So we're, we're making this like steps. We have Mishkan, we have Korbanot, which is the active service. And now we're saying, well, prayer is going to be part of that. That's going to replace it. We're going through a korban experience. Yeah? When you read about the korban, not in your prayer service, you're actually bringing the korban. Literally. This is why some people do not read Ashkenazim, do not read the Ketoret during the week, because you're so busy running around, and you may miss out one of the spices when you read it, and you miss a spice, you have mitah. People think it's literal. That's one of the reasons that Ashkenazim don't, but on Shabbat they do. They don't even read the Korbanot list during the week. If you look at the Ashkenazim Siddur, it's not mentioned during the week. Safaradim and Nusach Sfarad, which is the Siddur from the Hasidim, which is actually very similar to the Sfaradi one, both come from, very, um, from the same place. Yeah, Arizal most likely. Okay, as a side point, when you read about the Korbanot, but, but also your prayers themselves are having a korbanot influence. You're coming close to Hashem. Let's see the Rambam now. Because the centrality of the temple and sacrifices were very, very big in Jewish life. You must talk about this. Yeah. Sorry, just about the, like, the source of the Rambam? Yeah. Um, Ramban, yeah. So, on Har Sinai, that feeling of Gersh Baruch that Hashem's presence on Har Sinai left Har Sinai. It's not there anymore, but it is somewhere. And where's that? In the Mishkan. 
and eventually the Beit HaMikdash. Yeah? Yeah? Um, can I say the, the okay. thing real quick? Just because my theory is, is that the, sh the Shekhinah is what dwells in the Beit HaMikdash, and that's like Hashem's feminine, like that's a feminine word, so maybe the Korbanot Oh, was the feminine? feminine oh, that's very interesting. Shekhinah. You hear that answer? Maybe it's in the feminine because, because Hashem Shechina is also the fem, is Hashem Shechina is also a feminine word. Could be, I don't know. It's a Baba pay grade. Go speak to a Kabbalist. Okay, <laughs> says the Rambam in Sefer Mitzvot. There is a mitzvah, a positive mitzvah, yeah, to visit the Mikdash, but not only for offering sacrifices, as he says. The twentieth mitzvah in the Torah, he's listing the mitzvah, is to build. He Shitzivinu, right? Live not Beit Avoda to build a house of worship. Aha, sounds familiar, right? What was prayer called? Avoda Shabalev. It's all coming together, sisters. Boye Hahakarev Vavara Haesh Tamid. And the offerings and the continual burnings of the fire is going to be in this continual burning of fire, the Tamid, which will be get the Tamid light above the Aaron Kodesh comes from this, the constant fire was there, that's represented by the eternal light that you'll see in every synagogue above the Aron, right, connected to the Torah inside it, because it represents the eternal light as the Torah. Ve'lav yeh, halicha, v'aliya, v'regel, v'kibuz b'chol shana. And there would be a mitzvah to go three times a year on the Chagim, make a pilgrimage to the Beit HaMikdash three times a year, Okay, and he says, this is where it comes from. We would go up towards it on Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. At least people used to go at any time, right? Um, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot? Yeah. The Shalosh Regalim. Shalosh Regalim, the three foot festivals. Why are they called foot festivals? Because people go by foot to the Beit HaMikdash. So why not Rosh Hashanah? There, people could, but the obligations those three are. You have to know what this holiday is about because some korban are brought on those holidays. So, what was the function of the korban? So, let's have a look at three purposes for the korban. And by the way, if they apply for the korban, they apply for prayer. I guess what I'm trying to download into your heads today. So, what are the three reasons for korban? What are the three reasons? Okay. So number one is they brought the individual and the Jewish nation close to Hashem. Right? Which we said is hinted at in the word itself. Brought us closer, there it is, whoop, to Hashem. Just korban, even if you didn't bring a korban, the existence of the Beit HaMikdash had that function. We know, for example, in Yom Kippur, the high priest brought a korban Right? There was goats that were brought to see Irim. So one of those goats was thrown off a cliff, and the other one was brought in the Mikdash. Just that itself brought to Shubat to the people. It brought a kapara to everyone that was there. Right? Just that. Yeah. I don't remember the Hebrew word for it, but I remember in another one of your classes you talked about like the, the three types of mitzvot there are, like between man and man. Yeah. yeah. This list like kind of reminds mm -hmm. me of that. That's interesting. In a way. That's interesting. Okay, let's, let me just finish off the other two. Yeah. I can't remember what they are. And let's see if we can reflect. Not excited about could be, could be, could be. Like, you know what? Better get excited about that than other things. Oh, yeah. Number two. It brought a kapara. It brought a kapara. It atoned. Somehow all the korbanot. This is really the central purpose that the Korbanot did. They helped us to atone for our sins. Some were, I guess, more explicit than others, right? but they atoned. For example, there's a Korban that a woman just gave birth brings. She brings a Korban after giving birth. Why did she do that? Well, I guess it's gratitude, but also it could have been during childbirth. She turned around and said, I ain't doing this again. But Hashem gave us the gift of shikha, of forgetting, and therefore she was able to forget that and you know, have more kids. It could be just those words herself. She needs to atone 
because she has to be, and that could be this korban was brought. So each korban somehow, in some way, brought an atonement for Averot, for sin. So number one, for a close to Hashem. Number two, there was a kapara function. And number three, I'm going to go through, we're going to double click on each of these, to enable the continuation of the world, right? <coughs> For a detailed list of the thumbs up ring, we're going to come to that. Okay, fine. So it allowed world to continue. Akarsh Baruch says, central to me, existence was, I need the Korban. The, the Korban needs to be brought in order for the world to even continue existing. Okay? The perpetuation of the world. You know, they say with the destruction of the Mikdash, a vast amount was lost to the world. A vast amount was lost to the world. Okay, we're going to come to that. Let's start with the idea of coming closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay, that's purpose number one. Let's have a look at the words of Samson Raphael Hirsch. Okay. You see, he just brought a Korban. There was a process of preparation that was needed. If we walk with Mishra Beit Mikdash, you need to be pure, you need to immerse yourself in the mikvah, you needed to make sure you had no tumah, you need to have these ashes of the para aduma sprinkled on you to get rid of any impurity. That's why you're not allowed today to walk on the makom ha mikdash, up on Temple Mount. That is forbidden. There are some people, some people who do walk out there. They receive permission from their rabbis. Sfaradim do not and should not. What? I've never been out there. Because Sfaradim post Gemara gates. Rabbi, can you repeat the first thing? Sorry. What first thing? The first thing you need to, to be able to pray. You'd go mikvah. And you needed to be sprinkled with the ashes of the paraduma. Now, we have mikvah today, but we don't have the paraduma today. Therefore, you're not allowed to walk up there. But even those who do walk up, they don't walk on the central area, they walk around. Why would they be allowed? They're rabbis who say, you're not walking in the places. Like we know where the Kodesh, you can't walk in the Kodesh Kedashim. Sometimes like we don't know exactly where it was. Then, like, we do know, though, where it wasn't. So you can walk around that area. And they will walk up there, they'll go to the mikvah, and they'll wear non leather shoes, they'll walk around. Like the prayer would have like, uh, I mean, ideally, pray. yeah, but you're not allowed to. It's only the Makkah Mikdash right now, the Temple Mount. It's the only place in our store you're not allowed to pray. If you do, you get arrested. Oh. You know that? Okay. A lot of people bring like fruits and like we'll say broccoli. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Ok
Karva elokim icha patzon. They will seek the closeness of Hashem. The closeness to God is the only yardstick by which to measure the truth of one's worldview and one's well-being. So we're saying that this was just like a nice thing. This was the center of Jewish life because the, our job in this world is to come close to Kodesh Baruch Hu, and the Korban, the Beit Hamikdash, allowed us to do that. He says there, Sham, right, Bedvir Uvehechal, inside the holy chambers of the Beit Hamikdash, it becomes clear that one's spiritual and physical well-being will develop because of our closeness to our Kodesh Baruch Hu. By the way, probably should have mentioned this already. When you brought a korban, I mean, they're all different, but let's talk about the one that was a chatat, right? A sin offering. What did they used to do, by the way? What did they used to do? What was the physical process? Before they go, by the way, most korban, you should know, were killed and eaten by the bringer and by the kohanim and handed out, right? Only one was the ola, that was ola means to go up completely. Kulo la Hashem went to our Kodesh Baruch Hu, totally burned up. But most of the korban, not by, but what did you used to do? We used to do what's called smicha. What's smicha? <laughs> it's the same word. It's the same word. Smicha literally means to. No, that's something. This is smicha is to put your hands and to put your hands on something. You're giving authority. That's why smicha rab is called smicha because what they used to do was put their hands on the head of the student and say, "I'm not giving you the authority to do this." What they used to do was transfer their averot somehow to this animal, and what you were saying is that. I deserve to die for my Averot, but Hashem doesn't want me dead, he wants me alive. So they would put their hands on the animal and they would pray and say, let this animal die in my stead. And I'm going to give the pieces to Hashem, right? And to my family to eat and to the Kohanim. So I'm going to do a chesed together with this animal. But that's actually what's going, that was the dynamic behind the Korbanot. They would actually put their hands and say, I should be, let this animal die instead of me. Really should be me. So you were able to like experience the animal dying in your stead. That was the idea. That was happens to be the background to the korbanot. Yeah. Okay, you said just a little bit ago that there would be a goat that you would throw. Yeah, off not the that. Stuff. Yom Kippur. Yeah, that's part of the sort of sacrifice. Same idea. How is that allowed, though? Because the Torah says you have to do it. To throw something. They would take the animal sure. and throw it off the cliff, and that actually was the final. That brought the greatest joy to the Jewish people in Yom Kippur. That's, so that's sad. not kosher. Okay. So why is it sad? I mean, you put, it, does, well, is the goat alive and you're just throwing it off the cliff? Yep. That's so scary for the goat. I am. Better the goat than me. That's true. I'm just saying. That's true. Uh, okay. Better lamb than gin. Yeah, fine. So people will put their sins onto the korban? As it were, as it were, the korban was dying for you. Okay, and it was shattered and the blood was sprinkled broadly. There was, there was shchita, there was kabbalah, there was halicha. There was Zurika, the four, remember you didn't learn this in school, you should all the kids you because learns the four parts of bringing a korban, and that the process atoned, right? The blood of the animal right, ended up being part of the atonement for your, for your sins. So they try to relate that. Not everyone's very into that, but there's, there's a relation. It died. It died. It died. Isn't it kind of strange that you're transferring your sins? Something in the I'll tell you why it sounds strange to you, because other religions took this. Actually, the Rambam, the Rambam, I'm going to say something pretty wild, and says the reason Karish Barba even gave Korbanot was because the other Jewish people saw the other nations, this is a wild statement, by the way, the other nations saw, the Jewish people saw the other nations bringing their Korbanot, Favor Zara, and it was Baruch who gave them this as a Peshara, as a sort of compromise. Pretty wild statement, right? Very hard to say that, but they, there's this inclination they want to sacrifice. They want it as a as a desire, desire for this. Just like there's a desire to you to pray, right? They had, there was a great desire for this. Okay, so he says this is it's brought us close. That every every time a person felt distant from a kodesh baruch Hu, they wanted the beta mirrors, They felt close to a kodesh baruch Hu. By the way, I know we'll see the beta mirrors and people singing and dancing, having a good time. It was mostly blood. I right? think about the thousands of korban that were brought there. Right, for whatever reasons, right? It was blood running through the streets, right? The animals, you know, it's a major part of it. Okay, one second, one second, let's finish off the... Right, so he says, every distance that a person felt was removed, and you were able to come close to the Kodesh Baruch Hu, okay, all your sins, and then he says, you were left with the greatness, and he's quoting a lot of Tehillim, 
right? Of words of Korban, of Karev, bring us close, and that's what the Korbanot did. Remove the distance and brought us closer to our Karev Baruch. Yeah. So you said that people wanted to become closer. Yeah. I feel like now is the opposite. It's, it's like more of a... No, that's thing. more about today than uh, any other time. Well, why would but that's what prayer brings us close. I'm saying prayer is the ultimate, that's what I'm getting to. Yeah, but you said that they, they wanted to become closer. Like, even if they weren't, they would feel like they have to, right? Well, they'll desire to. Yeah, yeah. now that desire isn't so much. Well, I think anymore, it's right? there. Hopefully it's there inside every Jew. Whether we're acting upon it, it's neither here nor there. But we have that desire to pray, to talk to our Baruch Hu. Yeah. Okay, next is atonement for Averro. B. So what's the idea of atonement? So we touched upon it. Says the Rambam, the reasoning behind the tam ha korbanot, which means the taste of the korban. When the word tam is used, it means taste, but it means the reason behind a mitzvah. It's called the tam meha mitzvah. Just so you know, he's not talking about tasting a korban. Tam ha korbanot al ha nefesh ha shogeget is that um, it brings a soul that sinned, right? Because all of the sins that build up, you lead to Gennai Benefesh, affect the soul. So the soul, the Nefesh, is affected by the sin that a person does, says the Ramban. So Hashem says, well, you know what? I can't let the sin stay on the soul. So I'm going to give you a way to remove the sins from your Nefesh. And by the way, what part of the body, do we think we brought this down, relates to the Nefesh, the blood. So the blood of the animal comes and atones for the nefesh of the person. Right? And it would work for sins that were done unintentionally. Right? And a Gorosh Baruch was able to uh, atone, a person was able to atone for those sins. Yeah? Hey, look at the Rambam next page. Just the piece. I don't know how this over here. This is good. He says, since the acts of a person are comprised of thought, speech, and action, God commands us, right, that when an in person sins, they bring an animal sacrifice. They rest their hands upon his head. Yismoch yadav alav keneged hamaseh, because the head represents, right, action. You verbally say it, right, which is speech, and then you burn the insides which represents the physical thoughts and passions. So every aspect of it, it was the leaning, it was the, the killing, it was the burning, right? Because they were burning these at Korban, all right? All of this was carried out and they would bring the blood onto the Mizbeach, right? And all of this, says the Ramban, every part of it ended up being a kapara for the Neshama, yeah? Even the person who would watch it, all these actions, will realize that he didn't have virus. They would see it, they would feel like, wow, I made mistakes, right? And I sin against God Baruch with my neshama and my guf. And really, it's my blood that should be spilt for this avera, but Hashem in his great rachmanut, right? So this was a compassion, this brings great rachmanut. Mercy from God Baruch allows us, us to bring these various animals and these limbs, right, to our Kodesh Baruch Hu in atonement. Okay? And by the way, the Kohanim, when they received these gifts from the Korbanot, they would eat. If there were certain Korbanot that only the Kohanim could eat, or their family could eat, unless they, you know, daughters got married to a non kohen then they couldn't, okay, would actually pray on their behalf. So prayer was a major part of the Korbanot. The Kohen, you gave this gift to the Kohen, it was a holy Jew, right? And they would bring this as a, as a way for them to pray for them. You give a gift, and I'll pray for you. Right? Like you give the rabbi some money, he prays for you. Okay, okay fine. So look at page 24. We'll see a modern day update of this. The offering of each part of the animal assumes its spiritual meaning, such as, for example, instance, the suppression of sensuality symbolized by the burning of kidneys and liver, of selfishness by the offering up of the heart of the animal, consecration of life of the sentence. So each part of the animal you burnt up ended up becoming a korban. And the offering the incense, the burnt offering, but all this 
all of this somehow affected the individual. Okay, it brought a kapara. And that's really the main thing. By the way, as a side point, Shabbat, remember, is the replacement for the, right? Because we bring, and actually the Chazal tells us very clearly, Shabbat is Shuv, Teshuvah, which is why Shabbat, although you do not do Teshuvah on Shabbat, you're not allowed to do Teshuvah on Shabbat, you don't need to. Shabbat itself, going through the mitzvah of Shabbat, is Mechaper. That's why Yom Kippur is the only fast day that falls on Shabbat. That we allow to, otherwise we nidcha, we push it away. Right? Because it's Shabbat Shabbaton. Because Shabbat and Yom Kippur have something in common. They both atone. There's a kapara aspect to Shabbat as well. Right? A, there's a strong kapara aspect. Right? Better to keep Shabbat than to go to Yom Kippur, you know what I'm saying? You can have a choice. Yeah? So the kapara, the meat you eat, has the kedusha of the korbanot as well. Okay, great. Number three, we said it nourishes the world. What does that mean? So the korbanot didn't just affect the individual, the Jewish individual, didn't even just affect the Jew. It also affected the entire world, okay? It affected the entire world. As the mission of Pirkevot says, al shalosha davarim ha'olam omed. The world stands on three things. Al Torah, al Avodah, al Gimel Chasadim. Now it says al Avodah. Avodah we translated as prayer, but how do we get there? Avod Shabalei. But you know the real Avodah was the Avodah, Beit Hamikdash. The two are synonymous. When you talk Avodah as a form of prayer, you get there by the Beit Hamikdash because that's when the Avodah originally was done. Yeah. Yeah, when we talk about Avodah, it's actually referred, and that mission is referring to, but prayer is also called Avodah, Avodah Shabbalah, which makes sense because it replaces the Korbanot. But the Avodah actually means the Avodah, the Beit HaMikdash. Mishra, Beit HaMikdash, yeah. So the entire world was affected, which ergo, our prayers sustain and maintain the entire world. Look at the look at Rabbi Chaim Balazs and says, "Look at this beautiful piece. The mineral, vegetable, animal, and speaking creatures are all connected through the sacrifice. The salt of the sacrifice represents the mineral. The meal offering and the wine libations represent the vegetable. The sacrifice is the animal, and the human kohen is the speaking human. He's speaking, bringing prayers for us. So actually, all of creation was greatly affected by the board, by the uh, by the korban on itself, which is why." The destruction of the Beit Hamikdash and stopping the Korbanot affected the entire world. Okay. And the Maral says the entire matter of the sacrifices is to demonstrate that Hashem is one in the world and there's no power besides Him. The sacrifices demonstrate His unity in that compared to His greatness, all things are nothing. Every all Avodah went through the Beit Hamikdash, which was purely for Gadosh Baruch Hu. Right? What would the other nations do? They would bring Korbanot to their gods. As is that there's a plurality, right? We said no. One thing which is created only in the Beit HaMikdash. Yeah? Okay, so that's the introduction. We need that information to get to the next piece, which is the verse in Hosea, chapter 14, 3, bottom page 25. Because after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, there's no more sacrifice. Right? And has not been restored. It will be with coming Mashiach. Actually, we're going to see one of the jobs of Mashiach is to build the third and final Beit HaMikdash and reintroduce the Korbanot. Actually, that's not only one of the jobs. That's one of the ways that Mashiach can prove he is Mashiach. Wow. Mm. Boom. Yeah, I just said that. Let's have a look at Shia. So Shia says, this is a very famous verse that we used to sing as kids in my Jewish youth group in Akiva, right? And it says, Kachu imachem devarim. Says the prophet. You got this? Kachu imachem devarim. Take with you 
words. Bring your words. Bring your wor words. Sorry. Bring your words. Kuchu imachem devarim. The yeshuvu and return. Return we know already is <coughs> teshuva. Right? Teshuva shuv, return. Shabbat, we return to Hashem and Shabbat. Shuv el Hashem. Amru el elav. Kol tisarvon v'kach tov v'neshalma. Neshalma. Harim se fa te nu, and you will pay or bring harim. You're gonna bring your calves, your animals se fa te nu through your or our mouths. This says the Gemara, right, is the source how prayer is going to replace. The prophet was telling us, this Hoshe Navi is telling us, no Bobet HaMikdash, but you're going to kuchul imachem devarim, right, v'shuvu, v'shuvu, el Hashem, you're going to come close to Hashem, how, right, and oh, thereby, v'neshalma parim sefateinu, you're going to offer the words of your lips instead of calves. So the korban are gone, that's okay. There's another form of korban, prayer. Prayer is going to take it over. Yeah? That's the very important words of the Prophet. Everything is centered on the, that one verse of the Navi, of the Prophet. Okay, and the Gemara, we're going to talk about it, that's where it's all going to come from. The words take its place. What words? The words of tefillah and teshuvah. Used to be a person would bring an animal. We're going to have to anyone, no animal. What we're going to do? You're going to speak out your teshuvah. You're going to say it. You say it, it's like you brought it. Yeah? I'm just reading the words. Very important the words of how prayer are going to take the place. Yes? Um, wait, which thing means bring your words? Kahu. Devarim. Bring words with you. Bring words with you. What are they going to do? What am I doing with my words? You're going to talk. Talk to who? To God. What for? Whatever the Korban not did, your words are going to do instead. You're going to bring what? You're going to bring animals with your lips. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the Gemara in Sif Tov Beis So the Gemara in Barachot tells us, and by the way, as a side point, we are going to be learning at some point all about brachot, because brachot are also a form of tefillah, right? So we're going to learn a lot about brachot as well. Anyway. Like food brachot? Says, says the many types of brachot, not just food brachot. That's true, I just... Prayers correspond to tefillah, kenegat, to medium, to The regular prayers were instituted corresponding to the continual offerings. So the offerings stop, but our prayers come in their stead. And that's what we do. Shacharit. Mincha, Musaf, and Arvit. Okay? And the Gemara and Megillah says the same thing. Avram said for Akarish Baruch Hu, Hashem, Master, you old, we know that Jewish people are going to sin before you. Right? And you will act like you acted with generation that you're going to destroy them. What's going to happen? Right? He said, what's going to happen? Well, Avram knew that his descendants were going to sin. So he said to him, no. He said, well, how am I going to know? He says, take a cat. So you see that Avram Avinu brought a hello, brought a calf, right? And killed it and walked between it as if he was showing Avram Avinu, right? Masa Avot. Similar banim. Oh, I see. So what's going to happen is they're going to bring these animals and that's going to take care of all this into the future. Yep. Avram said to him, this is sufficient during the time of the temple. What happens after the Beit HaMikdash? This is a great Nebuah. He's going to be a temple. And he said, wherever they read them, I will consider it for them as though they brought me a sacrifice. So he brought a cow, right, for the brick benefit. I remember he said, this is going to take care of all that kaparot, all that fix up. So, but then there's nothing in a beta mega. Don't worry, they'll pray instead. So the Gemara is telling us that even our Ravina was somehow 
fully aware that they were going to have sins and this was going to be the kapara. And I'll forgive them, right? ani al kol I'll forgive them for all their sins. Yep, that's recitation of the korbanah and even the times of the korbanah, right? Because the prayer services do that. Happens to be, I won't do much detail, but bringing the korban not, sorry, reading these passages that we do, right, of tefillah that correspond, are also us saying, well, we want the korban not back. So, really, what you're really doing is also praying to Akarish Baruch about the building of Beit Mikdash, right? You're like Hashem, this is, this is not as good as korban, this comes in lieu of. This comes in lieu of the ani ba korbanot, you know? So every time we pray anyway, and we, uh, when we look inside the Siddur, many parts, but especially the Amida, we're gonna see that half the Amida is actually praying for the restitution of the Beit Migdash and the korbanot. They didn't realize that, we just read through it. You're actually praying to Hashem to rebuild the Beit Migdash. Well, how do you do that? You need Mashiach, right? Well, how do you get Mashiach? So we get up, you'll see, right? You need your judges back. So you'll see actually from halfway through the Amida to the end, pretty much, is all about the bringing Mashiach so that we can have Nebuah, so that we can have judges of old and the Beit can be built. You'll see that's the pattern that appears in the Amida. Yeah. Aren't there certain prayers that a woman are not allowed to say Hashem's name? There is, well, that's to do with, um, is there a mitzvah shesman grama and Sephardic, many Sephardic women, right, may not feel the obligation to say certain brachot, the rabbinic in nature, because most of the brachot are except two, and therefore some have the custom not to, also men, by the way, as well, right, the Sephardic, that's the Sephardic thing. When we get to the door, we'll see some differences among our Ashkenazic and Sephardic brothers and sisters. Nobody else have to say that. But what did you say? Well, you live in your school, in your community, right? If you're part of the Ashkenazi community, maybe people do certain, certain, certain prayers, right? They uh, don't say with Hashem's name. There are certain things like that. Why? There's no obligation in it, so it's a bracha levatala potentially because they have no obligation in it. They say it without Hashem's name, or they just think Hashem's name. So then, what's the point in saying it? Yeah, Still praying to Hashem, you're not, making, you're not invoking Hashem's name directly. Don't you want to? Uh, yeah, you're not be allowed to. That's so odd. Yeah. Yeah. We're not people. We are. <laughs> okay, the next piece is lengthy. One second. You know, only the next piece, the next class, because it's a whole dialogue in and of itself. Yeah, I hate so starting a new thing. Stop over there, have a good day, don't forget to pray, mention me in your prayers.